Welcome to Cannabis New York. In each episode, you'll get a behind the scenes look at the cannabis business. Two leaders in the industry tell all Elizabeth Case and Jerry Kremer from the law firm of Ruskin Moscow Faltacek. You can find this show at www.rmfpc.com and on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Now, here are the hosts of Cannabis New York, attorneys Elizabeth Case and Jerry Kremer. Hi, Liz. Hi, Jerry. Great We're to see you. We're back again. How, yeah. are, how are you doing, Cannabis? Okay. <laughs> Another week. Yeah, Lots I, more to report. I, you know, I, I was trying to figure out what the title of uh, today's uh, podcast was, but I think it should be OMG, something's happening. Yes. Exclamation mark. Yes. So it could, uh, also, it could also be SOS at this point. I think it's fair to say that the, the different arms of government are responding uh, to all of the uh, ineptitudes that have come out of this program so far, and they're really trying to rescue it. Uh, yeah. So we could talk about that. You know, you know, speaking as a former legislator, uh, I, I hate to say it, you know, but the state has fallen really far behind, if you will, on making this program workable. And, you know, you're not going to blame any one individual, but that the fact of the matter is that there should be a lot more legal uh, locations. Uh, there should be a lot more distributors, licenses, all kinds of, of the nine license category. Um, and the state has fallen dramatically behind. And by the way, the state's not collecting a lot of revenue, 19 million to date. So the answer is the state's got to speed up the process. And Liz, you're going to tell us how they're doing it. All right. So here's what I can tell you, Jerry. Last week when we spoke, we talked about the OCM Cannabis Control Board hearing, which are uh, articulated and responded to all of the deficits of the program that you uh, reviewed just now. And one of the responses came out in the form of a 300 page new regulatory framework, which is supposed to again re revise the, the way that this program is coming to be. And so another 300 pages, another 45 day comment period, it's, it's really just more of the same. It's a lot of paper, it's a lot of rules, but there's not a lot of action. And so just, just yesterday, um, Senator Cooney introduced legislation, which I would call a rescue bill. Uh, it's actually called the Cannabis Adult Use Transition Act. And in it, a very short seven page act, he is begging for real reform so that the actual marketplace can begin and we can essentially cut through a lot of this 300 page red tape and just finally have legal lawful storefronts that are selling New York product that's lab tested and safe and is able to collect that tax revenue. So what's the senator's solution? Well, the senator's solution is essentially to give privileges to expand the privileges that have already been given to the conditional um, license holders. And the only three conditional license holders that exist to date, two years after Murda, are the conditional processors, the conditional cultivators, and the conditional adult, adult use retailers who are justice involved. There's only three licenses that have gone through the system. So what we know is that the conditional processors and cultivators have been growing product for over a year now, but they have been log jammed to actually get it onto store shelves. So Senator Cooney has introduced this bill to say, okay, everyone, there seems to be a log jam. We're going to expand the privileges of those license holders. And we're also going to introduce a new player, the medical registered organization. Now, the medical registered organization, also known as medical cannabis companies that have existed for many, many years now. Remember, the Compassionate Care Act passed in 2014 and medical registered organizations, medical dispensaries have been growing from seed to sale their product for many years now. And what Murda did 
Was it grandfathered in the ability of each one of those 10 registered organizations to have up to three retail locations? What Senator Cooney has decided to do in his bill is to say, hey, everybody, we essentially have pre-approved applicants who are waiting to sell adult use cannabis. They have the storefronts. They have the infrastructure. They have the compliance all worked out. They have been paying money or own buildings. They, they are established cannabis companies. So they already were entitled to this right to sell. Let's get them selling faster. And we will make sure that 50% of the product that they sell comes from these small farms, the conditional cultivators and processors. Let me ask you a question, Liz. This kind of legislation takes the uh, medical marijuana people and puts them to the head of the line. And what about all the people who've been waiting at the social equity uh, potential applicants? I mean, in effect, what they're doing is they're jumping over them in behalf of big business, right? 1000% medical cannabis companies are multi-state operators. Again, antithetical to the spirit of Murda. Remember, Murda was meant to be mom and pop shops, small business owners, where people could come in at any aspect of the vertical chain and have a small business. Medical cannabis companies by nature are large scale operations. They are seed to sale. They are millions upon millions of dollars of infrastructure and uh, they employ huge amounts of people. And most of the time in New York, you'll see a registered organization or a medical cannabis company to be funded by multi-state operators, meaning companies that exist in Florida and California and Colorado and Washington state, Illinois. This is really important because it is essentially now New York state saying, hey, we, we know you can do it. You've been doing it. We need you to jump in but at a price. And this is the next thing I wanted to talk about, Jerry. What's so, the price? So exactly, there's always a price. And in New York state, the price of a grandfathered in right is $20 million. $20 million for any um, registered organization, any medical cannabis company to, to exercise their right to having three retail spaces. Now, how does that work? $5 million up front once they get their license approved, which should be in late August, according to this act. The next $5 million comes after they open their first dispensary on or before December 29th of 2023. And then the next $10 million in $5 million increments is when they open mm -hmm. store number two and store number three. So Liz, where does this money go? Does it go to the state treasury? No. It's going to go into the social equity fund that is going to be uh, managed by the DASNY group so that they can essentially help all of the other applicants that are waiting to get through, including the justice involved individuals who may already have licenses, but don't have the capital to open up their storefronts. So they're really giving a, a special preference to those companies who they we, we were told at the beginning were not going to get any kind of preference and they had to go to the back of the line. Am I correct? You're correct, but I'm not sure that any side of this is happy. The $20 million price point is probably shocking the conscience of the big multi-state operator, but realistically, they're happy to pay it to get into the space that is so fledgling because there are so few stores open that if by the end of December 2023, each one of these 10 ROs opens 10 stores, that's double what we have right now. But that's a pittance compared to the grand scheme of what med what sorry, adult use cannabis was supposed to look like in New York State by now. Is there a limit in that bill on the number of locations? In, in effect, are, are we going to have 300 locations from medical marijuana companies? Or is no. it capped? Right. So it's capped. It's grandfathered in that each medical cannabis company can only own three total and they can only open their first one this year, essentially giving a nod to the social equity justice involved card holders, allowing them to still try to open up before December and be competitive with the RO. But that being said, Jerry, there's also a, uh, a lot of rumor 
right. that the medical RO, the medical cannabis company uh, model will be opening up also to social equity applicants, meaning that ROs right now have been a closed universe of 10 license holders forever. Well, really it started at five, it doubled after a few years, but it has never grown since then. And rumor has it, Jerry, that the medical cannabis registered organization application will also open potentially to social equity applicants. Yeah, make that a little simpler. So I'm a social yeah. equity, I'm a disabled veteran, or I'm a woman-owned business, and I'm coming in for a social equity license. What's the, what is the uh, medical marijuana company going to do for me? Oh, well, if you can afford to open up a medical marijuana company, I mean, that is a multi, multi, multi-million dollar investment. No, I just want to open up a store on Flatbush Avenue. I've right. been in business for 40 years. I'm a, I'm a female entrepreneur and I want to open up a location. And in addition, I'm a disabled veteran. Okay. So, so was she shut out? They're not shut out by law, but they seem to be really delayed in coming to the, to the starting gate because there's still no understanding of when those applications will open. There's rumor and speculation that they will open before the end of the year, potentially at the end of the summer. Uh, again, after this 45 day period to review the new regulations. So this really is, you, know, you get me right now, the, the philosophy originally was everybody was going to do it horizontally. All the people were going to work their way through the system. Now it's coming down from the top, you know, uh, vertically. And doesn't this in effect go against what the original plan was? I think that's why this is a true rescue package because it is, it, it defies the logic of the program. But essentially what Senator Cooney is articulating is we really have no choice. If we're trying to help the farmers that have been growing uh, product for the last year and a half by their own license, we granted licenses to these farmers. And uh, as we discussed uh, last time, Jerry, the farmers have really gone into debt. They are in a terrible place because they are trying to grow and use their farms for this purpose, but there is no place to sell it. So that's another aspect of this, this uh, bill by Senator Cooney, which is to also open up opportunities for those small farmers. They now can become retailers of their own product processors of their own product, and they can also deliver their product to those um, dispensaries. There is, they can cut out the middleman up and until June of 2024. Is that, this is really this, a big deal. If this bill became law, and of course we don't know yet, because right. we don't know if it has a sponsor in the assembly. Um, and, and you know, there's, there's another three, three weeks before the legislature goes home um, I guess the real question is um, some small business groups might want to take this to court if it becomes law. There's litigation, I think, that surrounds all of this. And I think what, you know, there, there even could be litigation from within the registered organization community again. Um, you know, all of this is uh, really up in the air and unknown. But I think what we're seeing now is it's the transparency and admission that things are not working. If they're essentially thwarting the, the whole concept by these rescue packages and allowing vertically integrated companies to come in and bail out cannabis, it's suggestive of a bigger picture failure. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that essentially if this is a stopgap measure, if this is just a temporary fix, um, that really by the end of 2023, early 2024, uh, we can really start to see the bigger picture as it was. Um, let's, as let's, let's just jump back to last week. Um, there's another bill that's been introduced for the growers, right? Yes. Because they're going to be sitting with a lot of product uh, and they, they need an outlet to dispose of them. You want to just mention that bill briefly? Yeah. Because I think that's going to pass. Yeah, no, that one came out uh
sorry about that technical difficulties that bill actually was uh, meant to save the the small batch cultivators that came out on 420 and uh, it was sponsored in the assembly to essentially address exactly that issue and that issue is the um the fact that this product is piling up and there's nowhere for it to go so taking along the same premise um, it's allowing small farmers to, to basically have, um, you know, the old fashioned tomato stand or corn stand, farm stand to sell their product right out of the ground. And that's exciting for some. It's not exciting for others because, of course, it's a cash business. And there are lots of different things to think about with regard to the safety <clears throat> of those uh, farmers who were not contemplating and equipped for, um, you know, a high price item being sold right at their property line. So let us, let, let's sort of all of a sudden recap now. Strange things are happening because uh, the program has been slow. There have been nine license, nine, nine types of licenses. Only to date, you, as you said, three of them, you know, are, are in existence. So number one, it's an admission that the state's program hasn't gone well. Number two, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, a, it's also, a, they're making an admission that the state hasn't gotten very much money out of it, and that that program for social equity people has no funds available. So this is really a, a, a complete collapse on the part of the state and sort of like a, we call it a Hail Mary pass. They're I think to- it's exactly what it is. It's a Hail Mary. And essentially what it's saying is, if this is a, if you think it's a lose lose, it could also be a win win because multi state operators, medical organizations uh, are all too happy to spend that $20 million to get into the adult use space. So they've been also chomping at the bit. That was the whole reason for that lawsuit that came out in Albany earlier this year when card license applicants went first and they said, that's not fair. I'm entitled to a retail dispensary too. How come they get the, the, the ultimate fast pass? Um, you know, and others in the social equity line join them, women-owned businesses, veterans, et cetera. So essentially what this is doing is saying, okay, here's your money. I'll, ha- I'll happily pay the money. Let me in. And uh, they will get in and they will get in before others will. And it's maybe it's fair, maybe it's not fair. At the very least, product, 50% of the product on the shelves will be sold by the small farmer. And the other 50%, of course, is coming from their seed to sale operation. So, so this is really a bill. You know, I've, you know I'm, I'm hearkening back to my years in Albany. And that is that it's clearly a bill that may have been introduced at the request of, the in, of that industry, if you will, the medical marijuana people who are basically saying, you know, this is our special interest bill. We'll pay the 20 million, you know, let us in before everybody else, because the program has been failing. Uh, and that's really what it seems to be like. Um, of course, this bill still has to go through two houses and get signed by the governor. But uh, I have a feeling it will be successful because even the regulations that came out of uh, the Cannabis Control Board and OCM um, also contemplate that $20 million amount in the ways that this bill uh, articulates the, um, the the installment plan of payment. So I think this is sort of a global Hail Mary. I think everybody is saying, let's go already. Everybody's willing to do it. Open their applications on or before August 1st with a 30-day approval because generally speaking, they're going to be approved. They are they are longstanding businesses that are doing all of the compliance that New York expects of them. There well, should I guess, Liz, them. It's a, but it's fair to say that uh, a lot of people are going to be screaming, you know, how about me, you know, when this process is approved, because they've been waiting for a long time, too. So I think, you know, it's fair to say before we end cannabis is that there are going to be a lot of people who are very happy with this bill and there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be very unhappy with this bill. Wouldn't you say that? I would say that. And I would also always say stay tuned because week to week, you know, show to show things change on a dime around here. So whatever we think it is can change drastically in the coming weeks and months. And I'm optimistic that there will be so much uh, disgruntled people in, in New York marketplace who will want their opportunity too. that we'll see an opening of applications, not a closure. 
Well, the legislature goes home allegedly on June 9th, and they may still stay a little bit longer because a lot of unfinished business. So we'll both watch it. And on the next cannabis, we're going to tell our viewers the latest changes week to week, which are coming. That's absolutely right. Can't wait. Thank thanks, Liz. And thanks for all your terrific help. And, and thanks to all our viewers for watching cannabis. You've been tuning into Cannabis New York with your hosts, Elizabeth Case and Jerry Kremer from the law firm of Ruskin Moscow Foltacek. You can find the show about updated cannabis insights at www.rmfpc.com and on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Thank you for your positive feedback, comments, questions, and for sharing this show with others. The information presented by Ruskin Moscow Faltacek PC cannot be copied or rebroadcast without consent. This podcast is made available by the lawyer or law firm for educational purposes only, as well as to give you general information and a general understanding of the law, not to provide specific legal advice. By using this podcast, you understand that there is no attorney-client relationship between you and the podcast publisher. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state. 